Dear colleagues around the world, I would like to welcome you to this episode three of PCR Live from London. We are reporting from PCR London Valves, and it feels nice to be in London where the crowd is big and emotions are high. We would still like to update you on what is going on here, about the new things we heard, and about the amazing practical teachings that have been around during the Congress. To that end, we have prepared a series of episodes. This is the third one. Overall, there will be five episodes available to you on the course platform as well as on YouTube. Today, we are going to be talking about the late-breaking science. We will also hear what was new in the valvular tracks, mitral and aortic. And at the end, we have an expert interview for you, an expert who is going to put together everything we've discussed so far. So stick with us. Stay until the end of the episode. I think there will be interesting things for you to hear. That being said, I would like to welcome Chris Allen, who is here today with me. Chris was our ears and eyes together in the, today in the, in the late-breaking sessions. So we have prepared two late-breaking trials to report on. Yeah. May I ask you to uh, start with the first one, please? For sure, Dan. Thanks very much for having me here. So there's been a lot of science presented over the last 24 hours. We've picked out two to highlight from the aortic track. And I've got a couple of slides just to take you through. Just while we're bringing those up, so in terms of aortic stenosis treatment, as TAVI continues to expand into lower risk and younger patients, a couple of key issues for modern devices are um, the preservation of coronary access, both for future coronary procedures and future TAVA and TAVA, and also reducing the pacing rate. So in terms of getting our uh, implantation depth optimal and symmetrical. And that brings us to the first study, which is about the Evolute FX device. So this is an evolution of the Evolute platform. Um, and this is the first in man experience which was uh, just presented now by Gilbert Tang. Um, so in terms of the population, 168 patients with severe aortic stenosis. Interesting mean age of 80, so still quite elderly patients, although with a broad standard deviation. Um, over half of them women, and a median STS of 3% with nearly 40% low risk, so really reflecting that expansion into the low risk cohort. And as reflecting of, of modern TAVI, 90% uh, were performed without a requirement for general anesthesia. So the Evolute FX device has got several features which are aimed at um, tackling those challenges I mentioned. So improving coronary reaccess by uh, getting optimal commissural alignment and also improving the predictability of the implantation depth to try and reduce pacing. Um, it was a single arm open label design study. So the key outcomes with respect to those research questions they were trying to answer uh, about the new device, well, commissural alignment was achieved in 96% of cases, which is high. They were able to obtain a more symmetrical valve deployment. So left coronary cusp around three millimeters, non-coronary cusp around four millimeters. And that translated into pretty low pacing rates. So new left bundle branch block was in around 14% of cases and a pacing rate of 10%. And in terms of valve performance, well, mild paravalvular leak was present in 13% of cases, no moderate, no severe. And an exploratory analysis comparing this with a historical cohort of the, the prior Evolute platforms suggested that all of these are significant improvements on what's gone before. So interesting, and in terms of the take home messages, it's early days with this device, but it seems to offer improved commissural alignment and consistency in the implant depth. Thank you, Chris. Nice overview with, uh, in a style that we like, and that is a PICOT, population, intervention, control group, outcomes, and time. So my question to you is, what is new with this device? Is it the delivery system yeah. that was changed? Yeah, so there are a few changes. I mean, the most obvious, I've included a graphic on there, the most obvious are the, are the three dot markers, which are three millimeters from the inflow, which are aimed at being able to adjust the commissural alignment periprocedurally to try, to try and improve that. There have been some improvements to the delivery system. This device has a single spine, the previous had a, had a double spine, and the aim for that is to improve trackability and deliverability. They've also made some changes to the nose comb, uh, which meant that in this study at least, more of these devices were delivered using the inline sheath rather than a requirement for a dedicated sheath. And something they're calling a stability layer is targeted at that, that, uh, that implant depth and, and symmetrical nature. 
And how do you comment on the 10% pacemaker rate in this trial? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's good news, right? Yeah, it's really interesting. So 10% with a self-expanding device is, is low. And there's a bit to drill down into. So um, the, if, you, if the, the, the findings were reported including patients who had pre-procedural right bundle branch block, then that pacing rate does increase overall to 15%, which is not surprising. We know those are the higher risk patients for high-grade AV block post-procedure. Um, but, but certainly the, the headline results are interesting and it would, be, it would be very interesting to see if this is translated into clinical practice as experience grows. Thank you very much, very interesting news. And the second study you picked up is about aortic regurgitation. Can you tell us more about that? Thanks, well absolutely. And so we, we know that this is a population that is historically underserved by transcatheter treatments. Um, and uh, it, it's been a difficult population to expand treatment into. And, and this was a, a really interesting study that's the, the largest aggregate experience of using traditional TAVA devices in, in patients with pure native aortic regurgitation. Um, so I'll just take you through the, the PICO analysis. Um, they included 151 inoperable patients with pure native AR, and that's across 15 centers. So it does really give you an idea of the comparative rarity of this disease in comparison to senile aortic stenosis. Um, a mean age of 76 years with a high STS score of 6%, which we would expect these were patients who were deemed not to have a surgical option. Um, the intervention was including newer generation devices, both balloon expanding and self-expanding. And it was a registry uh, observational design um, and, and the results are, are interesting. So they compared BARC3 outcomes, so standard reporting criteria. Technical su success was 84%, so uh, certainly room for improvement. Complications were not uncommon. Valve migration occurred in 15% of cases and 8% of patients were left with at least moderate aortic regurgitation at the end of the procedure. And the important thing about those complications is they, they did seem to translate into poorer clinical outcomes at one year. So if, if either of those complications occurred, then those patients were much more likely to suffer heart failure rehospitalization or mortality within a year. So a comparison showing 36% versus 7%. So really significant clinical impact on those patients. They did an exploratory analysis looking at potential predictors of migration, which perhaps we'll come on to because the results were uh, certainly garnered a lot of discussion in the room in terms of how we interpret those for our clinical practice. But nevertheless, those predictors that were identified were low EF and the need for post dilatation. It was a pretty long term follow up. In terms of the clinical message, we know that in inoperable patients with pure native AR undergoing TAVI, technical success still seems to be suboptimal and that those complications are not uncommon and have an important impact on clinical outcomes. Thank you for this. This, I think, is, you know, an uncharted territory for yeah. us yes. as yes. of yet. So yeah. my question to you is actually, I have two questions. Okay. The first is, what devices were used in this study? Yeah. And then the second question is, what were the comments inside the room yeah about the migration rate, which was, I think, rather high. Yes, absolutely. So in terms of your first question, th these really were the newer generation devices. So in terms of um, self-expanding, you're looking at the Evolute R, Evolute Pro in particular, um, Navator platform, and, and the pr previous iteration, the Portico, and uh, the Accurate Neo and Accurate Neo 2. Self -ex uh, balloon expandable was the, the modern Sapien, and there was a small number of MyVal included as well. So it's across the spectrum. It's basically what's being used today in the cat lab. I think that's really important for our, for our, for our viewers. You know, the, these are the, the, the commercially available valves that are being used for autism. And stenosis. these are the results yeah. with the present platforms that we have. And yeah. that, I think, is an important message. Absolutely. And second, I wanted to come to the, back to the second question. Yes. What were the comments about the migration rate yeah. within uh, this session? Yeah. What, were, what were the comments that were saying? Well, so the, so the migration rate's pretty sobering. You know, it's, it's definitely a reflection that, that, that these procedures are associated with, with a not insignificant rate of complication. And there was some discussion about how, how to interpret the technical data and, and the predictors. So a, a comment that was brought out by one of the discussants was about the use of, um, of rapid pacing during deployment. So 
Those rates were reported obviously 100% for balloon expanding as we would expect, but only 80% for self-expanding. And the, the, the unanimous view of the panel was that in these patients, you really need to be rapid pacing in order to get, to get good quality results or increase your chance of getting good quality That's results. That's another very important message I think we yeah. got today. So yeah. thank you, thank you Chris no for all this. I would like now to uh, thank Chris and think about the practice. We've talked about theory, what was new, introduced two late-breaking trials. One was about the new Evolute FX device, and the second was about TAVI in aortic regurgitation. Now, when we go from theory to practice, the first thing that comes into my mind is simulation lab. And I think that is really a landmark, a benchmark that the PCR London Valves has set, and everybody that comes to PCR London Valves wants to be in the simulation lab room. With this, I would like to welcome Pamela, one of the organizers and main protagonists of the Simulation Lab program at PCR London Valves. Hello, Pamela. Can you tell us more about Hello. the Simulation Lab this year at PCR yes. London Valves? Of course. Uh, thank you, Dejan. Uh, so the Simulation Lab this year is uh, a new level of education. So it is uh, organized in three steps as uh, a simulation-based learning is uh, uh, organized with uh, a first step, which is uh, learning and uh, uh, having knowledge. So what uh, we usually uh, acquire from uh, books or slides. Then the second step is uh, uh, watching. Uh, the third step is uh, uh, practicing. And the first step is uh, doing before going to real life. So here in uh, London Valve, we have uh, the two first steps. So watching, uh, so learning and watching at uh, the learning, uh, with the learning um, sessions. And uh, the other step uh, is to train with some trainers at the simulation hands-on lab. And the third step will be the training on simulators at the training village. So this is uh, the pathway, the learning pathway that uh, we have created. So it's a comprehensive program in the simulation lab this year. Congratulations exactly. on that. I would like with that, that we turn to the S-curves. I was in a session this morning in the simulation lab, and I was closely following Nico Piazza and Ole de Becker, explaining all about the S-curves. How do you find the right projection for the right structure with the S-curves? And uh, I think the message that I got is that you can use it for anything you need in terms of structural interventions. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, of course. So, as you mentioned, uh, imaging uh, is fundamental for our uh, work. So, uh, let's uh, do what we do in the simulation lab. So, you assist to a learning session. Now, let's put into practice uh, the S-curve that, that you have seen for uh, aortic valve. Uh, it uh, can be applied to any structure. We can see uh, a slide from Nico Piazza and actually each structure in the heart has its own S-curve. But now let's go forward. Let's see, for example, a CT scan. So the S-curve is the 3D dimensional reconstruction of each structure. Um, let's change structure. So everybody is uh, used to do it with uh, our aortic valve. But uh, let's look for another structure. Yeah, we can do that as well. But I think the main message from this slide for our audience is that basically you with the S-structure, can all, you can use the different projections for different types of the procedure. For example, if you want to cross the wall, you can choose the projection based on the S-curve that tells you where the separation is between the calcifications, calcified um, uh, leaflets, and then cross the wall and into the left ventricle. So you can basically use it not only for the positioning of the valve for also all other kinds of interventions and procedures that involve heart structures. That being said, what I would like you to, to tell us is about transeptal puncture. That was a big part in the simulation lab about transeptal puncture. And I would like you, us to explain first on the slide and then secondly on this nice yes. uh, image, uh, the nice model that you brought, how is it that you can understand puncturing the atrial septum anteriorly, superior and inferior? Yes, Please, tell us more. For the, the S curve for the uh, atrial septum normally is uh, uh, more cranial. Uh, here we can see, for example, for uh, multimodality imaging, uh, what we see in the CT scan and uh, what we see in ECHO. Uh, here we see CT scan and uh, Nico, this is a slide from Nico, um, 
draw very well the structure. So let's concentrate on the atrial septa and on the mitral valve that you can see. And it's uh, what we can, that what we usually do with the bical view in echo. So when we go superior versus uh, superior vena cava or inferior versus the inferior vena cava, we go through lateral commissure or medial commissure. Uh, so let's uh, see, for example, in the model. So just, you brought a model. Yes, I nice. have my, my favorite lab? model. Do you use yes. the simulation lab? Yes, we Please use this because we this is the link between slides and uh, the, the reality. reality. So let's try to simulate this. So if you so go, so this is vena cava inferior. Ah, you go this in? is uh, vena cava superior, and this is vena cava superior inferior. So this the catheter goes right, from the vena cava inferior. Right side and left side. Uh, if we want to go superior, like this, if the puncture is superior, look on the left side where we are, which commissure is. Okay. Okay. Yes. And yeah. let's do it with the inferior. As you can see, we are... Goes more lateral. More lateral. So, so more lateral or septum. So the localization of yeah. the puncture will determine where you are going to be Superior positioned is lateral, yes. with relation to the mitral valve. Yes, and also with CT scan, you can be prepared if you have an horizontal septum, septum or a vertical, and you can choose, for example, your, uh, your catheter or, or uh, the bending of your needle. And uh, on the other side, let's see. The, the the CT scan and what we see, for example, in four chamber views uh, in echo, when we where we decide if we want to go anterior or posterior. So the height of the puncture. So let's look once again the model. So this that was the slide. This is the model anterior. We go. This is the anterior wall with the aorta, and this is the posterior. If we want to go anterior, look at uh, our position very close to the valve. Yes. If we want to go posterior, we are more high. So basically, yeah, you're at the same level puncturing the septum, but so, you're in a yeah. different relation to the mitral valve. Exactly. And this is very important when you plan your procedure, of course. Exactly. So it's a great model. Yeah. And with a simulation, actually, you can have this information and apply it, and you can learn very fast. And just for our attendees to hear, can you work on this model if you come to London Valves? Is this something which you offer yes, as exactly. a training possibility? Exactly. Uh, here we have uh, the learning session where we can show this. Uh, and uh, obviously our, uh, our colleagues can come and take a look at this. And then we have uh, other sessions where they actually can try to use uh, all these catheters and do, and do all these maneuvers under supervision of a trainer or uh, at uh, the training village, uh, also alone, which is important. If you, you, if you want to achieve a good level of, uh, of personal skills, uh, you can try and try again after a good uh, learning pathway. Thank you very much, Pamela. This is great. I think that uh, you now have seen a sample of how education in the simulation lab works, and I thank Pamela for showing us kindly the model. Now, what we think about when we talk about simulation is focusing on details. And you just had a brief excerpt of how a detailed transeptal puncture education would look like. When we go away from the details and into big topics, what you have at PCR London Valves is different tracks. So you can follow an aortic track, mitral track, tricuspid track. Who we have today with us are two ladies. Harriet, hello. Cara, hello. Hi. Both of them are going to inform us about Harriet about the aortic track and Kara about the mitral track. So what was new in the aortic track, Harriet, today? What was hot? What was the topic of the day? So I, I attended um, a session on the risk of coronary obstruction in TAVI. It was excellent. Um, as you know, uh, coronary obstruction, it's rare, but it's a well-recognized complication of TAVI particularly in those patients undergoing valve-in-valve valve tabby, and often uh, consequences are devastating. 
Um, during the session, they discussed the various mechanisms of coronary obstruction, which I've detailed in my slide. So most commonly, um, it occurs in those patients with low or small size sinuses of valsalva, with less room to accommodate the native valve leaflets, so that when the TAVI valve is deployed, it pushes the native leaflets outwards, and then they obstruct the coronary ostia. It can also occur as a result of a leaflet mass, such as a calcified nodule or dislodgement of calcium or thrombus. And less so commonly nowadays, but also direct obstruction from the TAVI valve uh, skirt. They then had a very uh, comprehensive session on using CT to assess the risk of uh, coronary obstruction, measuring the coronary heights, height STJ, size of the sinuses, and also uh, for those patients undergoing valve in valve TAVI, um, the virtual distance from the coronary ostia to the edge of the TAVI valve frame with a VTC measurement less than four being high risk of coronary obstruction. Very good. And did they discuss measures to prevent acute coronary obstruction? Yeah. What was highlighted in the session that you attended today? So they, they talked about the various uh, techniques in reducing the risk of coronary obstruction, including chimney stenting, mm. um, and then this was followed by a very nice uh, live demonstration from Jafar Khan and his team of the Basilica technique. So it was Basilica live? Yes. That's yeah, very nice. Very Can you tell nice. us more about the Basilica procedure? What did you learn today? So um, the Basilica is, uh, involves the laceration of the native valve leaflets uh, by cauterizing the native valve leaflets. And the idea is that it then splits the valve leaflets so that they no longer cover the coronary ostia. It's usually done at the start of the TAVI procedures through the standard TAVI access and, and ultimately they deliver a guide wire to the LVOT and then snare the guide wire to create a V-shape um, and then use that to lacerate uh, the leaflets in turn um, whilst deliver a radio frequency current. Um, obviously this adds some complexity to the procedure, uh, often it has to be done under GA with the use of TOE and there is an added increased risk of stroke but um, then it mitigates the need for rescue PCI, potential stent thrombosis and the need for dual antiplatelets in elderly patients that often have um, an increased bleeding risk. It's good. I mean, given the complexity of the procedure, uh, I don't know what was discussed during the session, but uh, what comes into my mind is that when you have a patient that has a high risk of acute coronary obstruction and you plan a valve and valve procedure, it may be better done in an expert center where there's an expertise because these, these procedures not so, are not so frequent. So basically you must have done it a few times before you master it. So I think that could be a message that, that, we, that we can deliver, that there are those procedures that can help us prevent acute uh, obstruction of the coronaries, but they may need to be done in expert centers Absolutely. who really know the procedure and have done it many times. With that, thank you, Harriet. Thank Please stay with us because we both want to hear what Kara says about the mitral program today. Yeah, what was your highlight? Oh, the mitral sessions this morning have been outstanding, but definitely the highlight was the session run by Sam Dawkins, the uh, mitral transcatheter etch edge repair step by step session. And this was a fantastic practical session, which was really directed at uh, people who, who are new to TIA, as, as I am. So people who are thinking about uh, establishing a program at their own centre or, or fellows, really about how to approach uh, the intervention, what do you need to think about, um, and they really walked you through from the beginning to the end. So I've got a, a slide that kind of summarises yep, the, the highlights. If could, yeah, if you could summarise with us the steps of the procedures. What I like about a step-by-step -step procedures in any disease that we have in, in the cat lab is that you can focus on a single step and exactly. see what you need to know yeah. and what you need to learn about a single step. So please tell us about the steps of, the, of this procedure. Yeah, here. so I think um, the team, the panelists were a combination of imaging cardiologists and interventional cardiologists. And really, we talked a lot about how this uh, procedure is a team sport. It's the imager and the interventionalist together and they're really important that they have a good working relationship. So the first part of the, of the procedure has to be your baseline imaging. You stand together, you do the toe of the patient on the table and you, you make a plan about how you're going to approach your procedure, where you're going to put your clip, where you're going to put your transeptal puncture. So that's step one. Step two is safe access. We're putting large bore uh, catheters into admittedly venous uh, access, but you know we can certainly have very big bleeding issues with that. So we tend to put in proglides up front and, and seal our venous access with proglides and everything's under ultrasound guidance. We don't want to prang an artery on the way through with our, you know, 16 French guide. 
Um, and then the third step, which um, you know certainly many would feel is the most important step of this procedure, is your transeptal puncture. Uh, not only is it important to make sure it's a safe puncture, but it's got to be in a position that is going to allow you to manoeuvre the device depending on the anatomy you're tackling. So, you know, certainly if you're thinking about a, a prolapse, you want to have as much height as you can. So that means putting your transeptal posterior in the mid uh, part of the septum um, as a start and then measuring carefully before you, you sort of cross the septum to make sure you're in the right position and always under TOE guidance, obviously. Um, number four, once you're across the septum, you need to set yourself up for success and that means getting the steering right in the left atrium. So make sure that your, your guide is in a good position and as you bring the device in over the mitral valve, making sure that your trajectory and your alignment are all optimal uh, so that when you move on to step five and you cross the mitral valve, you're in a good position to get that first grasp, grasp done. Um, we talk a lot about sort of getting to the first grasp as, as quickly as possible, because then once you're, you've got the first grasp done, you can reassess and decide where you need to be. So, you know, step five, get across, cross, make your first grasp, optimise as much as you can. And then step six is to really think about what effect have we had on the mitral regurgitation. And that has to be a multifactorial assessment. You can't just look at the colour. You've got to look at your left atrial pressure. Have you improved that? You've got to look at your pulmonary veins and of course you have to make sure you haven't caused mitral stenosis. Once you've done that and you're happy with your first graft, uh, graft, grasp, um, your next decision point is really about, you know, what do we do next? Are we done? Do we need another device? Or do we think that we really haven't made any improvement here? We've tried lots of positions. Is it time to bail out? Um, which is, you know, getting to number eight and deciding when the procedure is done. So they Very really good. went through different aspects and it was a great learning session. Very good, a final question to you. Going along these eight steps of the procedure, I see a lot of imaging. Do we need to cooperate a lot with the imaging specialists in order to get this right? Absolutely, it's, it's crucial. The imaging person is, is arguably the most important person in the room. Um, I think if you're thinking about going into mitral intervention, you need to pick your imager very carefully. They need to be someone who is uh, comfortable with a toe probe and that can, you know, cope with challenging anatomy. Sometimes we have issues with, you know, uh, people who've had previous bypass, you know, their heart might be in a funny position. If they'd had a previous aortic valve replacement, they'll be shadowing. So all these challenges, they've got to be okay with that. They have to be good decision makers, uh, be someone that's able to cope with uncertainty. Sometimes you don't really know if it's right or wrong. Sometimes you just have to let the device go and see what happens. So. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. You can't do the procedure without a, a you know, a talented intervention, a, opter, a talented imager. Of course, I think <laughs> that is the crucial point. Cara, Harriet, thank you very much thank for being you. with us. We now turn to hot topics. Now, to find out what the hot topics are, our colleagues have gone around the Congress Hall here in London and asked, what were the hot topics? What was interesting today around the Congress? So here now, what the talk of the Congress was. Okay, so welcome to day two of PCR London Valves 2022. Uh, we had an excellent day of science uh, and, and, and clinical medicine yesterday, looking at our three valves, the aortic, mitral, and tricuspid. Uh, I'm here with Bill Martin, who's from James Cook University Hospital in the north of England. Um, and uh, Bill, how have you found the, um, uh, the, the course so far? Yeah, I've been, been really enjoying it. I think, um, you know, it's clear that there's a lot of hype and, and focus on the mitral and tricuspid space this year. Um, you know, it was, it was nice to watch a few uh, Evoke cases yesterday um, and the Pascal live case this morning. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, it looks like Edwards has got a really good um, pipeline of, uh, of devices coming out, uh, you know, in the near future. And so what have you learned at the course so far you're going to take home to your heart team in the last couple of days? Well, um, you know, I was watching a live case just now from uh, St. Thomas's Hospital. They did a very slick demonstration of uh, the insertion of a, a tricuspid valve in valve. Um, I think the thing I took away from that case is that um, you, if you're doing a redo uh, operation, you should always replace a Star Edwards valve. That, uh, that seemed like the important take home from that. Great, so we're here with Sarosh Khan, who's from the Essex Cardiothoracic Centre. Um, so Sarosh, is this your first time at London Valves? It is actually my first time at London, PCR London Valves, yes, yes it is. And you're having a good time? I'm having a fantastic time. Great. So you're a presenter, what's, what's your presentation on? So my presentation is something out of the box, which is something we like to do at the Essex Cardiothoracic Centre, think laterally and work alongside other members of the team uh, beyond cardiology. And so my presentation is about reducing uh, femoral axis complications by reducing the femoral artery depth by using a novel technique with a very simple, straightforward 
uh, device that is actually used in obstetric theatres and nowhere near structural theatres. But we have tried to adopt it and modify it so that it can be used to reduce femoral artery depth and reduce complications in vascular access for large bore femoral access for TAVI. Fantastic. Uh, and so you're, you're obviously going to learn some things. Anything you're looking forward to to take home to your heart team with this course? I think as an early career structural interventionist, uh, for me it's a lot about interacting with everyone, meeting the people here and networking, but also the fantastic hands-on uh, simulation that you have here and to learn some skills and take them back to the team. When we're starting off in early careers, it's hard to actually get in and get your hands dirty in procedures. This is a fantastic opportunity to do that. Great, wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have Omar uh, Chahab, who's a cardiologist uh, from St Thomas's, who's uh, currently doing research in mitral work. Um, now, Omar, what, what do you like about PCR London valves? Um, what I love about it is it's sort of, it's just so varied in terms of you got the didactic uh, sessions, a lot of hands-on stuff, the simulation, uh, and you sort of, and the anatomical sessions, the sessions with Maizano, and all this sort of, and, and the, key, the fact that you've got all the superstars here you know, up close and personal. I think it's just unique in that sense. And so obviously PCR London valves is tailored towards three valves, aortic, mitral and tricuspid. You're doing some research into mitral valves. What do you like the most about this course in terms of, in terms of mitral work? What have you seen? Have you learned anything so far that you think is novel? What I like is, that, you know, you go through the spectrum of, you know, you go from the evidence and the guidelines through to the new latest devices and technology to outcome data. And then we go into some of the science in terms of whether it be hemodynamics or other aspects that are of interest to me personally. Um, and then through to actually practicing it and trying to implant devices here in this simulation. So uh, in that sense, my hope is to get my hands onto some stuff and, and, and you know, implant. Perfect. All right, thanks very much, Omar, and back to you in the studio. Nice to see you again. We've heard what the hot topics are, but we need now cool hats to discuss important topics in TAVI. And I'm joined by an expert, Philippe Genero. Hello, Felipe. Nice to see you. I would have a couple of questions for you regarding TAVI. You're an expert in TAVI. So my first question would be, how do you estimate the evidence base? We started with the high-risk patients, going now to the intermediate and low-risk patients. So I have to say that for the last 10 years, uh, Dejan, we have a lot of great data uh, coming from uh, Edwards, Medtronic, other sponsors. Uh, like you mentioned, we start with high risk or extreme risk, we showed that TAVI has a place there for patients that cannot have surgery. We saw that for high risk patients, TAVI is probably preferred. And then we went to intermediate risk that we said that TAVI is similar, uh, at least as good, in very selected patients uh, than compared to surgery. And then uh, we had two trial, randomized trials, they were well powered, that showed that TAVI has, is as good, at least as good as surgery for low risk patients. And I think this translates into the guidelines, both uh, side of the ocean being uh, changed and elevating TAVI both for high risk, intermediate risk, and now low risk uh, being a very um, useful tool to, to change the valve uh, of patients. And American have cut off a 65 years old and above who can do TAVI as a class one, and uh, European to 70 years old. Uh, and at the end of the day, this is where the data or the guidelines are, and then after that is all about our team decision uh, pay one patient at a time who's fitting better for one or the other technique. So I would like to ask about your personal practice because what I've heard from many colleagues is that when, they, when the center starts with STAVI, there is usually an age cutoff of 80 or more that patients go to TAVI or if they're really high risk and surgical turndowns. As the program expands, they go into lower risk categories. Now, what is the situation today according to your opinion in your practice regarding low-risk patients. So how do you handle this issue in your practice? So uh, I've been lucky enough to be uh, here uh, 15 years, so I saw the field growing. Uh, I'm part of a large program. We do around 800 TAVR a year, and we're lucky enough to have a strong, robust surgical volume also. So um, what we saw with time is when we have a patient, obviously 75 and above, TAVI will be preferred, okay? Obviously, we look at the CAT scan, and that's the key is the anatomy suitable for TAVI? If the answer is yes, we go with TAVI. If the answer is no, the good news for the patient is surgery is still around and is, is, is still very good, at least for intermediate patient and low risk. When you go around 65 and 70, this is where, or 75, this is where 
you really need a CAT scan, a heart team, and there's many considerations that uh, will push us toward one direction or the other. And we can discuss about what are those considerations, but in our practice, we, we do still 60% of high risk or extreme risk for TAVR. I would say 30% intermediate risk and 15 to 20% low risk. And the reason why we're still lagging with low risk, we do a lot of low risk, don't get me wrong, um, but it's because they, sometimes they have other pathologies. Sometimes they have coronary disease, need bypass, um, too large areola, um, bicuspid not very friendly for TAVI. So uh, it's case by case we decide what is the best option for long term uh, and also repeat procedure. You mentioned bicuspid. How do you treat that? I mean, do you see a bicuspid as a big problem for TAVI or do you still accept these patients and treat them as part of the pool of TAVI patients that you get? Yeah. This is, this is an issue that's going to be emerging if we go into lower risk patients and younger patients, I guess. Absolutely. So, obviously, there's the older bicuspid. This is another story, you know, higher risk or even intermediate risk. But when you go to low risk patient, a 65 years old patient, there's bicuspid and bicuspid. This is very circular, type 1 bicuspid, not too much calcium, eye coronary, not, no root uh, pathology. TAVI could be a good solution. Uh, if uh, it's doable and safe, and we can repeat the TAVI. For bicuspid, um, for bicuspid type 0, type 2, bulky calcium, um, uh, low coronary, this is a, still a surgical territory. And I would say that it's my, my rule for me is 50%. So I see a patient with bicuspid, 50% I can do the TAVR, 50% I send to surgery. And I send a lot of 75 years old, 79 years old last week to surgery because the bicuspid is not, it's not safe to do the TAVI. I can certainly put a valve in, but the result will be suboptimal with, with leak, maybe pacemaker stroke. So we know that those patients are more challenging. In the future, obviously, with new tool, so the shortcut or cutting a leaflet, we, we will be there probably in 10 years. 15 years, we'll still have this interview together and maybe it will be different, but uh, I think bicuspid and young patient, are, we should be still very cautious. You mentioned future. Now, did you mention future? What I would like to ask and to know, how do you see lifetime management when you approach TAVI patients? Thinking about long risk and thinking about the long-term issues, like structural valve dysfunction, what is your approach? Yeah, so that's, that's the key now. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what we, every day we see a TAVI uh, patient or we see an aortic stenosis patient, should I say. I need a CAT scan. We look at a CAT scan and uh, again, if the valve is large, uh, if the cornea are high, the sinus are large, I think if it, you could take a, a short balloon expendable valve, I think it's okay and you will have room for another one and another one maybe. Uh, that being said, not all patients are like that. So we sit with our surgeon and we, because we do so many cases, we're, we're comfortable sharing the good and say, okay, this is better with, with surgery, this is better with TAVR. And now we start to think about second procedure, third procedure, and come in mind the coronary access, um, come in mind uh, sinus sequestration. We discussed that in a prior episode. So there's all this, the heart team and the CAT scan, the imaging is crucial to decide the, the best option. Um, and also thinking or colleague surgeon, if the valve fail, how are they going to treat that? Okay, that's, that was a comprehensive answer. Now, we were talking about uh, risk that pertains mainly to the surgical risk, to the decision whether we should go for surgery or TAVI. Now, there are other sorts of risk in these patients that have aortic stenosis. And uh, I, I really appreciated your work on cardiac damage and how you can stage the cardiac damage and take it into, incorporate it into the decision-making process when you approach a patient with aortic stenosis. So what are the risks that cardiac damage poses to a patient with aortic stenosis and how does that change our indications and maybe expands our indications into a different direction, not only into a direction of a low surgical risk, but also into a direction of a more moderate asymptomatic aortic stenosis. So, uh, Dijan, I'm very glad you enjoy uh, the staging of a cardiac damage because we, we designed this, I, I would say, eight years ago. And what, we, what I had in mind at the time is I, I look at all the data of partner and I look at the guideline and I said, we're so late in the game the patient came with low ejection fraction, 40% AFib at 75 years old. It's ridiculous, it's, it's not supposed to be. Uh, they came with symptoms and the question is, is there a better way to stratify a patient from a cardiac point of view than symptoms or just a drop of ejection fraction? So we came up with this um, staging of cardiac damage um, similar to cancer. Uh, you know, you don't wait for cancer to have metastasis. We all know what a stage four means. It means that you're not gonna do well. 
So we kind of classify patient based on uh, is the uh, LV down, is the LA down, is the, the lungs down, the tricuspid leaking, and the RV down. So we classify patient in stage four, or four stages to characterize the extent of cardiac damage. And what we found, no surprise, is the more extensive the cardiac damage beyond the valve, the worse outcome are, even with a successful surgery or tavern. And then we also look at the quality of life, and the more cardiac damage you have at baseline, the less chance you're going to have a, qual a high quality of life after a successful TAVR or surgical AVR. So then we try to put all the pieces together, and this is where we designed the early TAVR trial, where should we wait for symptoms? So we, we finished the enrollment of 1,000 patients with severe S, no symptom, TAVI versus uh, surveillance. We're going to see in one year the result. But now we push the envelope, like you suggest, to moderate AS. So why do we go to moderate AS? Are we just crazy and we want to put TAVI in everyone? Not really. When we look at the disease state, there's a lot of patients with moderate AS, 1-1, 1-2, 1-3, migraine, migraine of 33, 35, that have symptoms and have a lot of cardiac damage. They have low AF, diastatic dysfunction, nt pro -BNP is high. So what we want to do is really to see a aortic stenosis differently, not only in fact rated by the valve and the valve area, which is a very imperfect metrics, but more as a comprehensive picture, as a cardiac stratification, a disease of the myocardium or the cardiac muscle, and say, okay, Yes, I follow the aortic valve area going down, but also follow the cardiac diamonds going up. And then we, 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 we de determine the sweet spot for intervention. So I think for me, the next 10 years will be to redefine the way we define aortic stenosis in a more comprehensive way, include more, uh, I would say, precise imaging, biomarker, cardiac MRI to detect early damage so we can help patients to have a great quality of life and survive longer uh, with their valves. So if I understood you correctly, and with this I would like to, to end, uh, you think that at certain points in the process of cardiac damage, we could intervene on the aortic valve and save the patient and improve the prognosis. You think there is this sweet spot in the process of cardiac damage where we should intervene, never minding the symptoms, and also going into the moderate aortic stenosis direction? Absolutely, and we designed a progress trial uh, based on this premise, so moderate AS with cardiac damage, and what will be the progression of damage? And the key here is we want to make patients live longer, we want to make patients live better with a great quality of life, and we want to save cardiac damage, meaning we don't want to wait one or two years and have AFib or have a diastatic dysfunction that will never disappear, and then we're stuck with a third problem or a second problem while we're very happy that we changed the valve, but two years later. So the key is to determine what is the natural history of modern AS and what is the sweet spot to save life, improve quality of life, and save cardiac damage. Thank you very much, Felipe, for this. With this, I would like to close the episode three. The main message for me from this uh, morning was that as we expand the indications and go into new procedures to cure structural heart disease, including TAVI, but also interventions on, on, on other valves like mitral and tricuspid, we will face new challenges. And courses like PCL London valves are here to discuss these challenges and to see what can we do about them. Please stay with us. At seven o'clock UK time, we will have another episode this time with Chris Cook. Thank you very much for being with us.